When the storms of life are raging, the waiting can be the, the greatest struggle. Feel trapped in darkness and cold and alone. Lost. Wondering. Feel desperate for a sign. Thirsting for solace, but finding none. Stranded and surrounded by the rising waters. Endlessly running, but never reaching your goal. Fighting the temptation to simply give up. It's in these moments when hope seems lost. Listen, for I am calling out. Hold on. I, I have not forgotten you. Hold on. You are precious to me. Hold on. My rescue draws near. For I will lift you out of that darkness. And in the midst of suffering and storms, reach out your hand to mine. And hold on. And I want to invite you, if you would, to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. And I love this book. And the more that I have studied this book, the more that I have come to realize that the heartbeat of this book of Habakkuk, this Old Testament, what is called a minor prophet, just three chapters long. It's not very long at all. I think there's uh, 56 total verses in the whole in the whole book of Habakkuk. Is this idea of when you are in the dark? Hold on to your faith. And so here's what I need everybody to do this morning, because we're going to open up with a few questions, and I'm going to need some audience participation. But in order for this audience participation to work, everybody is going to have to kind of steal their nerves, okay? If uh, you didn't want to get your feet stomped on today, you might want to tuck your shoes under the pew, because uh, this is just going to happen today, because it happened to me in studying, because that is what this book does. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to turn to your neighbor, and I need you to say this. This morning, I promise to be honest. Y'all ready? Okay, here, here's the first question that, that I really want us to understand today. How many of you would be willing to admit that you are exhausted by the 24-hour news cycle? You just go ahead and raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand, okay? All right, how many of you would just say, like, I physically get nauseous trying to watch the news or read the news anymore because of all the bad news? That might not be everybody. It's okay. I just want, I just want us to be able to see what it is that we're dealing with today because I want you to understand where we're going to go, okay? How many of you would, would say that you have looked around at all of the evil in this world and said, God, I'm so tired of all this. How many of you would say this? How many of you have ever had doubts about your faith, even doubts about your faith in God? How many of you have questioned God's goodness when you have looked around in the world? I don't know if you've saw. I don't know if you paid attention. Our back row Baptists got a front row view to what everybody has struggled with, okay? They saw all the hands just like I did. And some of you, may, hey, you know what? I, man, my faith is strong. God gave me an extra dose of faith, and that might not just be something that you have struggled with. But what I want you to understand is that the great majority of believers have struggled with doubts and questions in their lives. That is something that we have struggled with before. And so many of you identified with that. Many of you have said, man, I've, I've had those questions. I've, I've experienced those doubts. I've been in a season of crisis. And one thing that I want us to understand today, and something that is really, it, it's really kind of terrible. It's a terrible testimony. The church has not been a safe place to have doubts and to have questions. 
There, there's been a lot of people who would, would judge you unnecessarily if you expressed that you have had doubts and questions in your faith journey. And that is a shame. Because all throughout the scriptures, we see people wrestling with their faith and wrestling with their doubts. And in the 21st century, there have been many people, this is a, a, a term that has kind of been coined really here recently. It's called deconstruction. Faith deconstruction. And really, I, I kind of always go back to Charles Templeton. Does that name ring a bell with anybody else? There, there might be a few of you. How many of you know the name Billy Graham? Okay, so then you should know about Billy Graham's best friend in the whole world named Charles Templeton, who was an evangelist with Billy Graham, went on crusades with him, preached to countless thousands of people, led many people to the Lord, but he looked around at all of the evil in the world around us, and he came to the conclusion that God must not be real. And he turned his back on his faith, and he turned his back on the church, and he left the pastorate, and he left evangelism, and as far as anyone knows, he died as an unbeliever, but one of his last words that he reported to someone, a journalist, who had come to do an interview with him in his dying days, on his deathbed, literally, he said, you know what, I miss the Lord. But friends, here's the problem is so many people are deconstructing their faith instead of the church becoming a safe place to ask questions and to express doubts and to say, I don't understand this. And so that is what we're going to be launching into, that there are those who are honestly searching and to be sure, there are people who are antagonistic to faith and the church, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is for honest searchers, honest questioners, people who have just gone through something and they don't understand. And so they're personalizing this question. Listen, listen to the difference in the way that we can ask these questions and that people can ask these questions. We can personalize it and we can say, God, how could you? Or, or it can become impersonal, and this is where the danger lies if we ask the question, how could God allow? Did you notice the difference? God, how could you versus, versus how could God allow? Listen, Barker and Bailey are commentators, pastors. They said God is the friend of the honest doubter who dares to talk to God rather than about him. Did y'all catch that? God is a friend of the honest doubter who talks to him rather than just about him. The Bible is full of honest questioners. Maybe you recognize some of these names like David and Asaph and the sons of Korah. If you've ever read any of the Psalms, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Or Job or Jeremiah. These are people who have asked questions and expressed doubt, but they've expressed their questions as worship. They, they brought their questions to the Lord. Did you know that over a third of the Psalms which is the song book of the Bible. Over a third of the Psalms are songs of lament. They're songs of just crushing blows in life. And, and what do we do with this crisis situation? How, how should we respond as followers of, of God, as, as faithful believers? And friends, I, I don't know about you, but I've been in those situations my own life. I've needed those psalms. And so I want you to understand you are in good company when you express those doubts, when you have those despair, when you have those questions. I would love it if you would. If you haven't already done so, open up your Bible to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, we're going to tackle just the first four verses. We're going to go through this book verse by verse uh, over the next, uh, I think, four weeks, four or five weeks as we get ready. This is going to take us through Thanksgiving as we get ready for the Christmas season. And then we're actually going to look at all of the Old Testament verses to prepare us for Christmas. And that's going to be our Christmas series. It's going to be Christmas in the Old Testament. And so we're looking forward to it, going through this book of Habakkuk. But I would, if, you, if you would, would you, would you stand with me if you're able to in honor of God's word? One of the, the, the 
distinctives of Reformed theology of what we're talking about today is sola scriptura. That means scripture alone. And this is our authority. Did, did you know that we've got a lot of people that preach their opinions? We don't need any more opinions, do we? We need the Word of God. And so that's why sola scripture, and we're going to read from the scriptures today. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. And so justice goes forth perverted. Heavenly Father, we can read things like this and it can be very sobering. And it can be very somber. Because we hear a a titan of faith, a a prophet of God, of yours. And he is asking these tough questions. And he's expressing his dismay and his own discouragement and looking at the evil of this world. And so God, what he's going to demonstrate for us in this book. And God, I'm so thankful for your word. That we don't have to be afraid of our doubts or our questions because you've got big shoulders and you want us to come to you and to converse with you. I'm, I'm so thankful for this dialogue that we can lament and we can question, but Lord, at the end of the day, we can trust in you. You are our sovereign king. And so, God, would you open up our eyes that we can behold your glory today. Open our ears that we might hear a message from you. Open our hearts that we would apply it to our lives as we go forth from this place. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, you know, what I really want you to understand is that we can read a book like Habakkuk and we can kind of come away saying, we can read some of these things and we can, we can think, well, you know what, the, the world is just different today. But really, friends, I... I just don't think it's all that different. There are some things that are, that are different, but this book is as contemporary as reading the morning newspaper or, or listening to the, the 9 o'clock news report. It, it is contemporary because we are going through much of the same things that Habakkuk was going through. Let me, let me, let me introduce this with, a, with something out of one of my commentaries. It says this, Planet Earth may look marvelous from a satellite, But for those who live on the dusty globe, things tend to look rather grim. Increased turmoil, rising terrorism, mounting tragedies, unprecedented trauma, increasing pollution, deepening trials, and unparalleled tensions cast dark shadows over earthlings. And the world looks more and more like some ominous black sphere with a very short fuse, a time bomb sizzling to explode. It is little wonder thinking people begin to ask questions. Why is there so much oppression? Why all the injustice? Why do evil men prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God clean up this mess? Why? 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 And these penetrating questions are hardly new. Centuries before Christ visited this planet, an ancient prophet looked around at the violence and the wickedness of the world and cried out to God, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? The prophet not only asked the mysterious wise that plague mankind, he also received answers to his questions. And the answers given by the creator of the universe are carefully recorded in this little book called Habakkuk. As contemporary as the morning newspaper, friends. Because we can all relate to and reflect on those opening words. Or, Or maybe we can just go to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse number 20. Maybe this will will ring true from you, written almost 2,000 years later and seems to be exactly what we're going through today. 
for God's invisible attributes, verse number 20 of chapter 1, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that we are all without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And he's talking about idolatry there, but all you have to do is open your wallet in America and look at the green bills that are in there, maybe if you're so fortunate, right? And know that we have a different idol in America. We have different idols. In fact, all of us do. Our Hearts are idol factories. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Paul wrote that to the church at Rome 2,000 years ago, and it's still as true today as it was when he penned them. He could have been describing 21st century America, could he not? And that's what he's trying to explain. Listen, I, I, think that, I think that Solomon, I think that the writer of Ecclesiastes had it right. There's nothing new under the sun. All of this has been done before. And so if you think it's, it's so bad today, trust me, it's been bad. And sometimes we look back at the past with rose-colored glasses and we think it was so much better then. And maybe in some ways it was, but most of the time it was just as bad. And what Habakkuk wants us to understand, what Paul wants us to understand, is that we can look around us and we can see all the problems. But friends, I want you to understand, and something that I, I desperately think that we need to, to reflect on is that when we look at the church in the world today, it isn't a whole lot better inside our churches than it is outside in the world. It seems like, seems like every other day we're hearing about some leader, some pastor, some evangelist, some TV ministry personality who has fallen away from the faith or who has succumbed to some great temptation in their life, lust or money or whatever it happens to be. The great majority of believers today who identify as evangelical, greater than 55% of those who identify as evangelical have not evangelized a lost person in the last year. They've not shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe today you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, that's, I haven't done that. I haven't shared the gospel. I haven't shared the hope of Jesus with somebody else. Most evangelicals don't even invite people to church anymore. And what a shame. What a shame that we would have evangelism in our very name and we wouldn't evangelize. And so we can't just look out. We've got to be willing to look in. We should deeply desire to see the word of God honored by the people of God. And that was Habakkuk's heart. He was looking around at the world, but he was also looking at the people of God. 
And they had become guilty of terrible, terrible sins against God. And Habakkuk's heart was that divine blessing only comes by means of faithful obedience. I want you to understand something, friends. I'm going to say something, and you may not like it, but I want you to understand that my heart is the same as Habakkuk's heart. I will not say or sing, God bless America. Let me let the pen drop. You know why I won't sing that? Because America does not bless God. I will sing God bless America when the American people turn back to the God that established them and loved them and repent of their sin. Then I will sing God bless America because blessings follow obedience. You might not like it. You might say, that's anti-American, that's unpatriotic. No, it is exactly American. It is the most patriotic thing I can do. It's to call our country back to the God who called them. But friends, more than that, to call the church to obedience. To call the church to revival. To call the church to repentance. To trust and obey. And that is what Habakkuk was doing. He, he was saying, listen, God, I don't understand this. I look around and I see your people turning their back on you. What are you going to do about it? And friends, sometimes I wonder the same thing about my own country. What is it going to take, Lord? What is it going to take for the church of Jesus Christ to turn their attention back to their Savior? What's it going to take for a nation who was once considered to be a Christian nation, and maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. Well, what's it going to take for our nation to be revived by the Holy Spirit of God? Habakkuk has questions. And Habakkuk's oracle is really a pronouncement of judgment. Friends, here's the reality of it. In this little book, there are 66 years of prophetic vision in just 56 verses. Habakkuk is going to look ahead over the next 66 years. He's going to see God's judgment on Judah and God's judgment on pagan nations around him. But his question, again, just to, to reiterate, Habakkuk is saying, God, why haven't you judged Judah's sins? I could say the same thing today. God, why haven't you judged America since? Contemporary as the morning newspaper, friends. Habakkuk's words are as much for us today as they were for the nation of Israel so many thousands of years ago. But here's what's important for us to understand. It can come away, we can come away from a question like that feeling rather hopeless. But Habakkuk's prayer wasn't a hopeless prayer. His prayer was that they would be revived, that there would be revitalization in the nation. C.H. Spurgeon said, when the Lord pulls a person down, he does it in order that he may build him up again. When he breaks a person's heart, it is so he may make it anew. God wants to build us up again as the church. He wants to give us a new heart. He says, I will take out your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. He wants to soften us again. He wants to revitalize us. But friends, how do you make meat tender? You gotta beat it to death practically, right? You gotta beat that cow again. You want that tender steak. And sometimes with us, friends, we have calloused our hearts and our hearts are not tender. And so we go through trials and temptations in our life that are gonna tenderize us. Or... They're going to make us even more callous, depending on the direction of our questions, of our doubts, of our complaints. And so the historical context is this. There's been a, a string of good and evil kings in Israel and in Judah. The nation is divided between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, where Jerusalem is. There's been all kinds of kings, good and bad. And most recently, there was a king named Josiah. I love King Josiah because I named my boy after him. King Josiah assumed the throne at eight years old. And he loved the Lord. 
And he brought national revival to the nation. He brought the people together and he tore down all of the idolatry. And he said, we are going to go by the letter of the law. We are going to pursue the Lord. And as long as he lived, they did. But when he died, it didn't take long for the nation to find itself in terrible wickedness under his son, Jehoiakim. And in the final days of this Assyrian empire, they fall to what is known as the Chaldeans. Or maybe you better know them as the Babylonians. Chaldeans and the Babylonians, they take over and they begin to expand the Babylonian empire. And so approximately from 609 to 605 BC, Habakkuk follows Nahum. Uh, He's contemporary with Zephaniah and Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah is going to talk about the fall of Jerusalem under the Babylonians. That's what the book of Lamentations is. It's literally an entire book lamenting, mourning the fall of the people of God, the nation. And this is unique because Habakkuk is the only book that is, that is dialogue. It's quite literally Habakkuk going back and forth with the Lord. Habakkuk asking questions and God answering them. There's rampant sin in all of Israel, including what we read about in Habakkuk. If you look back, he, he, he kind of mentions several things. He mentions violence and iniquity. He mentions destruction and strife and contention. But the greatest tragedy, my friends, is injustice. Habakkuk kind of reads and he's like, it seems like evil wins. Go back with me. Verse number four, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. That, That word there, so the law is paralyzed, actually means that the law is chilled. How many of y'all think it's a little cold here this morning? I heard some of you this morning were coming when we turned the heat on a little bit uh, earlier because what happens to our fingers and to our toes when they get chilled, right? They get numb. They grow ineffective. You go to like try to write something or, you know, take papers apart and you can't because your fingers are chilled to the bone. And this is what happens to the law of God. It is rendered useless by, by a broken legal system. How many of you would agree that when we look around at our legal system here in America, it seems broken? Contemporary as the morning newspaper, friends. This is what's going on in Habakkuk's day. There's crisis and corruption. The legal system is broken, but he acknowledges the sovereignty of God. This is what Habakkuk believes about God. Exodus chapter 34 Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, God is manifesting himself to Moses on the mountaintop. And he says, the Lord passed before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Over and over and over again in the, in the Old Testament, we see this very same thing. Habakkuk knows, he affirms that God is good and faithful and gracious and he's patient towards sinners. He, he knows all of these things, but he is looking around at the world. It's because of Habakkuk's faith in God that he stands and he looks and says, God, if all of these things are true of you, why is all of this happening? If you are good, if you are powerful, if you are perfect, if your eternal character is all of these things, then I'm perplexed. I don't get it. And so Habakkuk has perplexity and impatience, and he begins to feel isolated and angry because God promised to hear pleas for justice. In the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament. He said, when people call out to me, I will hear them. Even when they would go into captivity in Egypt, he promised to hear their cries for deliverance. And he delivered them. And that's the beautiful thing that we need to understand. Habakkuk desired cleansing and revival just like we should. We should desire cleansing and revival. If we really love our nation, if we really love our churches, then friends, we need to 
yearn for and pray for and long for cleansing and revival. We need to long for God to be honored here. And so to Habakkuk, God seemed indifferent and insensitive and idle. Remember what I said about being honest? Have any of you ever felt that way? That God seemed indifferent, insensitive, or idle? I have. I sure have. I mean, I'm a fixer. My wife wants to tell me how, how her day has gone, and I want to fix everything, right? She doesn't want me to fix anything. She just wants me to listen. Right? She just wants me to be an ear. And I want to fix everything. And I'm impatient with God sometimes because I want to see things fixed in my timetable, not in his. Anybody ever been there? We can be impatient people. Here's, here's what I want us to understand. There are two prevailing questions that we're going to see in Habakkuk. Right here in this introduction, there are two questions that we're going to see. Number one, we're going to see this question, how long? How many of you have ever been going through something in your life and you ask the Lord, how long? How much longer do I have to go through this? How long? You're in good company. Book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 13, verse number one. A Psalm of David. He says this, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Anybody ever felt that way? Read the Psalms. You'll be encouraged. You'll see that you are not alone. One of the things that the enemy wants to do in your life is to make you feel isolated, to make you feel alone, like you're the only one who's ever gone through it. I want you to know today, you're not. You aren't alone. You're not the first to have these questions. You won't be the last. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But listen, verse number five, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Every single one of these psalms, they turn. You know why? Because David is personalizing this. He's offering his questions as worship. And he knows at the end of the day, how long might be the question on his heart, but the response of God is, trust me. Just trust me. Hold on. The second question is this. You've asked maybe that question, how long? But how many of you have asked the question, why? Why, God? Why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening around the world? Why is this happening to my loved one? Why is an expression of, we just don't understand. We can't comprehend what is going on. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 says this again. Maybe you'll recognize this. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? That sound familiar to anybody else? But a few days before Easter, Jesus was hanging on what we like to call the old rugged cross. It was about the ninth hour in the afternoon, and Jesus lifts his head. Crucifixion is agonizing. Medically speaking, I mean, he's in hypovolemic shock, which means he's just lost a tremendous amount of blood. The scourging of Jesus was, uh, it was just awful. He's in shock. He's lost a ton of blood. He's dealing with all kinds of, of injuries. And his underlying muscles and sinews are exposed. His bone is exposed from the lashings that he's taken. He's wearing a, a crown of thorns that have been forced onto his head. He's naked on the cross. He's just exposed to the world, to all of the elements. 
And, and in order to take a breath, Jesus would have to push up on the nail that is being driven through his feet and take a breath and then let himself slump back down. It's the only way that Jesus can even take a breath. And, and at one of those moments, Jesus pushes himself up on the cross and he says, Eli, Eli, lama shabakhtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever felt totally alone? Friends, I want you to know you're in good company. Jesus asked that question. He asked why. If anybody tries to tell you that it's sin to question God, then look to Jesus. He's the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. And he asked why. Because he didn't understand. Because of great pain. Because in that moment of human fragility, Jesus would have done anything to not have to go through. That's why he was in the garden. Lord, if, if this cup can pass from me. And I say that Jesus didn't understand. In fact, I, I think Jesus understood it all. I think he understood it better than anybody. And he knew that his father would have to turn his back on sin. But aren't you glad that Jesus took upon himself the sin of the world? I sure am glad he took upon himself my sin. That sin that would make him to cry out, my God, my God, why? Quoted by Jesus from the cross, and I want you to know that your doubts and your questions are in good company, but that lament and trust is the goal. Lament and trust. Mourn, ask your questions, express your doubts, but express them to the Lord. The direction, the direction of your complaints, of your questions is what's important. That's what makes righteous protests so unique. Righteous protest is healthy questions accompanying resolute obedience. It's being willing to say, God, I don't understand this, versus saying, I, how could God do this? You've got to personalize it, just like the psalmist, just like Habakkuk. Bring those doubts, those questions to the Lord. God's reply to Habakkuk implied that the righteous, godly person exercises a continuous and abiding, confident trust in God, even in the face of all adversity and trial and in every circumstance of life. That's what commentator Thomas Rogers shared. It's trust in God. You know, Habakkuk's name, I didn't share this earlier, but Habakkuk's name means something like one who embraces you know, we started this message with that video that said, hold on. And I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been through necessarily. I don't know all of your stories. But I do know this. If you ever find yourself asking those questions, honestly searching the, the character of God and the Holy Scriptures... And you wonder why it is that you are going through this particular season of your life. And you wonder, how much longer, Lord, am I going to have to go through this? How long? Why? I want you to, to be like Habakkuk, the one who embraces. And I want you to hold on to Jesus. Did you hear me? Hold on to Jesus. My friends, nothing else matters but holding on to Jesus. Peter stepped out of the boat onto those waves. Do you remember? Stepped out of the, 
out of the boat onto the waves, and he began to walk towards his Savior. But when Peter took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. He began to be overwhelmed. Friends, how many of you have ever felt overwhelmed by your lives? Hold on to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Some of y'all are going through some difficult times. Some, some of y'all need to, need to have that reminder today. Be the one who embraces and hold on to Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just simply ask that you would be with us today. You know, we have questions and we have doubts and we, we don't always understand what's going on around us in the world or even in our churches. And God, we, we desperately want to see revival and repentance take place. And God, I, I have to be honest and say, God, I, I want that revival and that repentance to take place right here. But first, it's got to take place in me. Now, there are areas of my life that I have failed to surrender to you, and it's most often that those are, the, those are the areas that you need to work in me most that will bring that revival and that repentance in my life. And so, God, I know that there are people here today, some of which may need to, they may, they may need to confess you as their Savior and Lord for the very first time because they've never asked you to forgive them. They've never confessed you as Savior and Lord. They've never made that decision to follow you. Lord God, I pray that they would, that today would be the day of salvation for them in accordance with your word. Lord, maybe there are those who today would say, you know what, I've had a lot of questions and I've had a lot of doubts and I don't have all the answers, but today I'm ready to trust in Jesus and to hold on to him. And maybe they need to rededicate themselves. Lord, maybe there's some who just want to be obedient to baptism. And Lord, maybe there's some who want to join this church. Or they just need to come and pray because you have pricked their hearts and you've convicted them today by your word. Lord, whatever it is that they need to do, my prayer is that you would embolden them to do that. God, give them the power to do that. So God, I simply ask that you would be with us. You would help us to direct our questions to you and our doubts to you. And that like Habakkuk, we would hold on to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we would keep the faith. And that we would trust that you are always in control, Lord. That you are always on your throne. That you are sovereign over this entire universe. Lord God, we do love you. And we do thank you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.